Hi, ever since the Prime Minister of India announced subsidies for rooftop solar for residential in the month of January, the market has been exploding. And so much so that states like Maharashtra and Gujarat are now leading in growth of rooftop solar on residential. But rooftop solar, or solar for that matter, is a much, much bigger market, including obviously for commercial installations or factories across the country. I spoke with Orb Energy, a Bangalore-based company, to understand a little more about how the entire solar energy market is growing, both rooftop solar at home or residential, as well as for commercial, and to understand the prospects and opportunities for solar as a whole. Uh, my guest for today is Damien Miller, the founder of Orb Energy. Damien has uh, been in Bangalore for about 17 years or more and uh, founded this company at that point of time. Damien, thank you so much for joining me. So uh, I know you're joining me from Bangalore, where you are headquartered. So uh, what brought you to Bangalore and how long have you been there now? Uh, I've been in Bangalore now 17 years. Uh, what brought me to Bangalore other than the great weather was uh, the fact that um, at that time I was working with Shell in their solar division. I'd been there eight years. And in 2006, Shell took a decision to stop their solar operations. They exited the solar industry, and uh, myself and my colleague in Shell, we saw an opportunity to take the business forward in India. Right, and what was the market like at that time in 2006 in solar power generation? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the, the starting point for that is that in terms of rupees per watt, a solar panel at a wholesale level would have costed you somewhere around 160 to uh, between 160 and 180 rupees per watt. Today, if you want to buy it at a wholesale level, you're probably going to be buying it at about 15. So the order might has been a huge decline in the cost of, of solar technology, which has obviously opened out new segments and opened out the market. And, and what did you start with when, when you launched in 2006? Yeah, we, I, well, because the price was quite high at that time, we, we launched in what was called the off-grid market, because that was the only market that existed for solar then. And that meant the market that where people had basically very unreliable power. Many people had a grid, an elect, a connection to the grid, but it was super unreliable. And so that took the business out into more tier uh, two towns and cities. And it meant that we were in often in very rural areas as well. And we as a company to service that market at probably our height, uh, we were at about 170 branches spread across five or six states. Uh, serving predominantly the residential markets for backup power as well as solar water heating. And, and I'll come to that in a moment. So what was your first installation and where was it? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, our first branch that we opened was in, uh, in, in Uttar Kannada, which is just uh, the northern part of uh, Karnataka on the coast. Uh, so we were in a tiny little town called uh, Kumta. And uh, that's where we opened the first branch. That's where we did our first installations in 2006. And that should not be too far from Goa, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> correct. Yeah, correct. But a very different market. It's not the Goa market. It's very different. Okay. And, and uh, how have you grown since then? Yeah, we've grown. I mean, we've really, uh, as a company, we've, of course, and, you know, everybody who's been in a startup knows that as you're in a startup, it pivots over time. So we've, we have pivoted with the market over time. In around 2012 to 13, the government at the time, the Congress government introduced the National Solar Mission. Uh, that led to net metering in states like Karnataka, where we had our largest presence. And net metering meant that not only now did, could, did, did off-grid solar make sense, but also on-grid solar make sense, made sense. This was coupled with after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, there was a big decline in the cost of solar uh, panels. So they were, it had gone from 180 rupees down to about 40 to 50 rupees per watt. And that combined with net metering meant that large residential uh, installations emerged, small commercial and industrial res installations emerged. And we as a company really started to pivot on grid away from off grid. We also saw at the time that also the the off-grid market was declining. The grid was getting better. As the grid get, got better, it was natural for solar to shift from off-grid to on-grid. And also at this time, you know, the cost of solar started to 
make uh, economic sense in terms of comparison with grid prices. And that was a total revolution because historically solar had always been much more expensive than grid electricity. And, and, and can you explain for those who may not follow what exactly is the distinction or difference between on-grid and off-grid? Sure, yeah. So off-grid is where you, you're not connected to the electricity grid in any way. You're not interacting with the grid. You have a battery as backup. And so it's often called um, behind the meter. So you're just not, you're not interfacing with the meter in any way. You're not getting any benefits of sending power back into the meter. You're just using the solar power that you generate. You store it in your own battery and you use that at night or during the day as you wish to power certain loads in your house or your business. When you go on grid, you connect, you, there's an interaction with the meter, you have to get approval of CEIG as well as the DISCOMs to connect. There is a policy framework that governs that. Um, and so, and you must synchronize, and you use a different type of inverter to synchronize with the grid. And then you have an interaction where you can consume the power you produce, but if you're not consuming it, you can also sell it back into the grid. And so at the end of the month, under net metering, the government or the DISCOM takes a look at what, how much power have you produced and how much power have you used. If you have used less than what you produce, then you get a refund from the DISCOM. If you have consumed, if you have consumed more than you produce, then you only pay the difference between your consumption and your production. And that, in essence, is net metering. And, and I'll, I'll come to the institution in a second, but since you mentioned it, so I've seen this uh, in, in some homes in Bangalore, and I know that people are now pumping uh, electricity into the grid and uh, netting off, as you said. Now, uh, that's one place where it's working. Does, uh, does it work in any other state in this form? Yeah, absolutely. It works across India in this form. Net metering has become quite commonplace uh, across almost all states in India. Karnataka was a leader at that time. Um, under the National Solar Mission, but it's become commonplace. And for, for instance, our big markets are Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Gujarat, uh, and even into, into the north of the country. So it's a, it is widespread now. No, so let me supplement that question. I mean, uh, is, do you see people doing this as, let's say, uh, as much as you see in Karnataka now, as in are there lots of homes yes. in these other states that you mentioned or as many homes? Yes. Yeah, actually, the leading homes, uh, the leading states for the residential market, since we're talking about homes, would be Gujarat and Maharashtra. Karnataka is not at the same scale as those states in terms of residential connections at this stage. So, so these, these states have obviously overtaken Karnataka because you said Karnataka used to be ahead at one point. Yes, time. Yeah. Okay. yes, yes. And I think they've responded particularly well to the introduction of the subsidy by the Prime Minister uh, for the residential market. Which is only, uh, I mean, only about six months old now. Correct, yeah, correct. It, ha it is having a very big effect on the residential market. Um, I mean, for us as a company, we became primarily a commercial and industrial a rooftop company because in India, compared to other countries, the commercial and industrial electricity tariff for the grid is higher than residential. Often in, in, other, in other markets, the residential is higher per unit than the commercial and industrial. But here there's a cross subsidization that takes place. So it was very natural for the commercial and industrial companies to be the first to adopt rooftop solar because they had the biggest benefit to do so. They also had the cash to do so. For a long while, residential struggled. You know, the payback was quite long and customers weren't interested. Payback used to be six to seven years, even last financial year. Uh, and now with the, with the subsidy, it's more like four to five years. And suddenly there's a big in increase in attention. Right. And I'm going to come back to residential in a moment. So when, when we say rooftop in buildings or commercial complexes, I'm thinking, for example, Cochin Airport or Delhi Airport. I mean, these are the really big ones who I've who are, have installed and obviously seeing the benefits of it. Some of them are saying that almost all their electricity needs are being met by their uh, captive rooftop solar panels or systems. Uh, tell us about, is that, is that, first of all, am I on the right track? And then what else have you been seeing and have been doing? Well, I mean, those are the high profile visible ones when you're taking off from an airport, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's understood. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we as a company are, Probably our strength is that we really serve the SME uh, in the, so we serve SMEs. That's where we find the biggest uptake 
from our customers. And there we've served thousands of SMEs now across India with rooftop solar. You may not see them because they're not as visible as you're moving around the country, but, but industries uh, and commercial and industrial entities across India are adopting rooftop solar because the payback now on a, for a commercial industrial user is two to three years payback, which is an unheard of unsubsidized payback. Let me be clear, the commercial industrialized sector is not subsidized. It doesn't need a subsidy. It works purely on, on commercial terms. It is, uh, it is a no-brainer for any industrialist in India today. And that's so you will find, if you go around, you will find a lot more rooftop solar than you can necessarily see from the car. And we have serviced, I mean, we have some rooftops, uh, some complexes for one industry that went up to seven megawatts, which is much bigger. It's three times bigger than what you see in Cochin. So it just depends on the SME you're dealing with. We also deal with SMEs who just need 10 or 20 kilowatts it's, um, if they're a petrol bunk. So it just, you know, we service all of that and the demand across the whole SME spectrum is huge right now. Right. And uh, uh, what, what's the seven megawatt installation? I mean, what is it powering? It's, a, it's an entity called Klenpax, uh, K-L-E-N-E, Pax, P-A-K-S. And I think, it's, I think it was put on about three or four different factories of theirs. It, it basically produces the fertilizer bags that you see uh, around the country, the thickly woven plastic fertilizer bags. They're the leading production producer of that. They cut their electricity bill. It's a high energy intensive uh, unit. They cut their electricity bill by 40%. We have other entities that might not need as much power, like a Kia showroom that has cut their electricity by 100%. So it just depends on what the entity is and how much power they need. So you're saying that uh, the, the fertilizer bag company consumes about 14 to 15 megawatts of power on a running basis, of which roughly 40% is what the panels are providing right now yeah. on Correct. a good day. Correct. On a good day, exactly. Okay. On average, I mean, that's an average production unit. When you talk about seven megawatts, that is what it will produce on average over the year. Right. So what would be the average size of uh, uh, an installation? Since you said seven megawatt is large and you said there are smaller uh, SMEs whose needs are smaller. But what's the average size, number one? What's the kind of industries that you find them usually servicing? Or what's the kind of industries that usually come to you or have been coming to you? And third, uh, give us a sense of uh, the costs particularly the upfront capital costs? Sure. Okay. Uh, so we see that um, the average size is roughly, if, in terms of rupee, it's about a crore. That's the average SME um, price tag. That will deliver somewhere around 300 kilowatts, uh, 300, often people talk in KVA, so 300, 300 kilowatts, uh, equivalent to KVA. The... Um, that is, you know, in terms of the type of SMEs we serve, broadly, if you look at, the, you know, if you take a generic title like manufacturing, the manufacturers of anything from, like we said, plastic woven bags to auto components to uh, die cast, uh, there's so many manufacturers that you find in India. I mean, 40% of India's industrial output comes from SMEs. So we cover that full spectrum of manufacturing SMEs. Um, and that uh, they, they, like I said, the average size will be about one crore ticket size. So the one crore uh, is the upfront cost to set up panels, all the wiring, the inverters. Everything, uh, and, 100, and, and, and the, synchronized the grid. And not the storage, I'm assuming. No, correct. Storage, once you have net metering, the, the grid, it basically acts as your storage. You, you pump power into the grid as you don't need it. You consume from the grid as you need it. It acts like a battery. Um, now, that said, over time, we think as storage costs come down, that then you might see uh, SME customers, C and I, commercial and industrial customers also adopting batteries to reduce their consumption from their diesel generators. That's the next phase of growth as, as uh, lithium right. batteries and, uh, declining costs. For most of your SME customers or those who you've, you've supplied uh, in these installations, how much would the solar panel output be in terms of or in proportion to their overall, uh, let's say, their consumption at this point? Yeah, it's a 
it's a broad spectrum. Uh, so you have to work with averages and sure. the average yeah, yeah. tends to work out at 40, 40%, 40 to 50%. Uh, we do have, I mean, I think what a, a very interesting um, new segment that has emerged for us are those customers who adopt rooftop solar, but they find because their energy needs are so high that they can only get about 10% or 15, 20% of the electricity they need from solar because they have electric furnaces. So think about foundries, uh, precision component companies. These guys need, they, they need electric furnaces to melt metal and, uh, and pour metal. So the, those guys then need to go offsite. And so we've also started to produce, do a ground mounted solution for SMEs where we'll set up, for instance, in Arthikeri, just outside of Bangalore, we've set up a 35 megawatt solar park. And then SMEs come and they buy a portion of that, much as you would buy an, apart, uh, an apartment in an apartment building, they can come and buy a two megawatt array. And that will probably be about 10x bigger than their rooftop system, generally, on average. But it's a, it's a great way for them to also get the benefit of solar offsite in addition to rooftop solar on their facility. So can you explain how that works again? Uh, you have a ground mounted solar park, which is mm -hmm. somewhere else. So mm -hmm. I go and commit to a certain amount of power that I will buy from it. And that, that no, actually we do, we do a different model for, because we talk, we don't, we don't ask you to buy the power. We, we don't remain the owner of the asset. We actually, uh, if you're the SME, we encourage you to buy a subarray. So if the unit is 35 megawatts in our security, we've served about 15 SMEs with that. So they've all bought about a two and a half megawatt, roughly give or take, um, subarray. They own it. They own the land under it. We sell them the land under it as well. They then can take the accelerated depreciation benefit, which exists in India for those who companies that own solar and are profitable. They can take that benefit and then they produce the power and they can offset that power against their electricity bill. The beauty in India, I think one quite a revolutionary and certainly um, I don't, as I move around different parts of Asia and Africa, I don't see a lot of other countries that have it so clearly functioning, but that is the policy of open access. Open access in India means that you can have a, a unit producing power offsite and take the benefit of that against your electricity bill on site. And that's made a, that's opened out a huge market in India for SMEs as well as larger corporates to go off site to get their power that their rooftop wouldn't have provided. Right. And which means obviously, uh, or rather, does it have to be the, within the same uh, electricity board? So for instance, RCK is obviously in the same state. So uh, mm. the power is being generated there. My plant may be South Karnataka or North Karnataka, yep. but I can get that benefit. Does that work? That's how it works, exactly. Within Karnataka, we think over time that will emerge to allow for interstate transfers as well. But at the moment, it is state specific and it can work across the four or five different discoms that exist in Karnataka. Right. And uh, yeah. how many days currently are you seeing in, uh, you know, in terms of, let's say, the good sun days and full utilization? And how does that vary today in India in the parts that you're active? Sure. I think the best way to think about this is in the industry, we talk about how many of units of power are you getting as a user per kilowatt installed? So when we typically, what you see is like say Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, uh, across Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, those markets, you know, you can pretty much guarantee uh, that you will get about four units of power for every kilowatt installed. Now that four units in the monsoon months might become two and a half to three units, but then in the months of Jan, Feb, March, it'll shoot up to five units. So you'll see over the course of the year that your average that you get will come out as around four. Right, so manufacturing plants obviously need consistent, clean, uh, continuous power. So how do they manage uh, with these kind of variations and, and to what extent are they normally able to, let's say, invest? For example, if my need is one megawatt, how much would I invest in solar? Because I know that solar was, is not going to be there all the time and therefore I'll need to rely on the grid once again or diesel genset back or something else. Sure. So a couple of points on that. So um, 
it all obviously like like we said earlier it really depends on your consumption we can where there are some entities that we serve where we get it to 80 percent 100 percent consumption from of solar from the rooftop it just depends on the size of your roof relative to the electricity demand you have but let's say you're what you want a one megawatt and it's going to give you 40 or 50 percent of your power needs it'll cost you in this market, around three crores for one megawatt. To give you an idea, it's about 30 rupees a watt uh, for a megawatt scale. For smaller systems, it'll be a bit more. Um, and so for one megawatt. So then you come to the point about how do you manage between your solar and the grid? Um, really, it's, it's a seamless, it's very seamless. You simply use more grid power during the monsoon months, uh, during the heavy sunny months, of you know the, of the peak sun months of like of, a, of Jan to April, you use more solar. The beauty is that with net metering, even if you have a day off, you're producing power and you're feeding that into the grid, and you can net that off against your electricity at the end of the month when you get your bill. So once you have net metering, that that those fluctuations work. You know, is that they work? Uh, of course, it's more for. The utility in India, as more and more solar comes online, to manage those fluctuations, you know, and to make sure there's never, you know, because they'll get spikes in solar production and they'll get drops in solar production, and then they have to have other sources of electricity that will kick in, and that's where large-scale storage will start to help utilities balance their grids over time. Um, in terms of how you manage the cost, uh, one of the things that we bring to the table is a company that is totally unique. If you're an SME, is we will finance you off our balance sheet for up to five years. So and we can even if you've got a good, if you've got a really good uh, credit rating, a good track record, we can give you zero percent down payment. This is something you won't find. I mean, we do work with SBI and we do work with SIDB, and they will give you better interest rates than us. But you won't get the you won't get the same. Uh, they will ask for collateral. They will ask for a higher down payment, and those things will yeah. Those things, it's a choice for you as a, as a, as a, um, an entity, whether that what's important to you. Right. But in commercial, uh, and I'm going to come back to the mechanics of it in a bit, but in commercial, you're saying that there is no, uh, subsidy, but there is subsidized <laughs> loans. Is that correct? Uh, in commercial, there's not, I don't know whether you can call them subsidized loans. Or is it I mean, commercial? Is it the full commercial? I mean, no, you, I guess you can. I don't want to say that because I don't know okay. what SIDB or SBI uh, do what SIDB or SBI do, but it's a um, uh, it's a they have SIDB might come in around six or seven percent interest. Uh, State Bank of India will come in around eight or nine percent interest. We we have a fixed rate of twelve percent, but we don't ask for any collateral. We don't ask for we don't ask necessarily for a down payment, and we can get it done in seven to ten days. So it's just a very different um, proposition for you, and it's for you, every SME has a choice. Most SMEs are quite interest rate conscious, quite interest rate sensitive, but some SMEs are more conscious and concerned about their collateral. Right, and and uh, how many installations do you have currently on that you've already put up in the last decade or so, um, or more? So basically, we've done. If you look at everything, we've done a hundred and I think now the latest estimate is about one hundred seventy thousand installations. If you take um, all the residential and off-grid systems we did in the early years. If you look at our CNI PV installations, we've were about fifteen hundred uh, CNI PV, so SME installations for rooftop. Um, we've done more than three hundred megawatts of rooftop installations, mostly for SMEs, uh, and uh, and then we've done a lot of. In addition, historically, commercial water heating has been a big part of. Of solar, of the solar industry, we've done more than ten thousand of those over the years. So, we have a big base of SME customers, a big base of residential customers, and you know, we we really our aim always is to really make sure that customer base is happy and is giving us good referrals to the next customer. So, and and the hundred and seventy thousand installations, how much uh, energy do they cumulatively generate as an approximate figure? Well, if you look at 300 megawatts installed and you take the average of, of four units per day, um, you're talking about uh, 1.2 gigawatt hours a day on average. Got it. Okay. And uh, wh what's the servicing requirement and how are you uh, yeah. managing that? 
So the first thing to say is we have always, as a company, taken service hugely seriously. Um, it's a it's a core part of our business in a way that when we started, when I first started looking at the Indian solar market, even back in the mid '90s, there was always the then it was very government driven. Service was an issue, so I think when we set up the company here first as when we were with Shell and then subsequently as Orb, service was key to us. And so we give three preventative maintenance visits in it in the first year, and we think that's really critical because any customer has to get used to. Um, how solar works, just the dynamics of it, how the inverter works. And there'll, there'll be issues, there'll be questions. So we we come out three times to see you in the first year and we don't ask for any money. And we, we just schedule that preventative. And that obviously has a cost, but we think that's a cost that's worth bearing as a business to establish the rapport with the customer, to make sure customers are happy, to make sure systems are functioning. And that's, so that's very critical. Uh, you know, so first preventative maintenance is key. That said, when you start to turn to uh, solar systems that don't have batteries, there's not a lot that can go wrong. Your main issue is then really your inverter. We make our own solar panels here in Bangalore. We don't buy from China, we make our own. Um, and we see that the panel pretty much is 100% solid. Very few issues with our, ever with our panels. The inverter, they can take a, a it might get a surge of electricity, from the grid, it might, you know, uh, burn the inverter. So, but the inverters are warranted from anywhere to five to seven years. So, as long as it's not the customer's fault or the wiring in the in the pre-existing wiring in the factory, the customer has a warranty for that. That's your main service area. The other area for service is cleaning. Cleaning is critical. This is, I mean, one of the. <laughs> we shouldn't say it's funny, but I, I it just, I, I don't understand it. Um, Somebody will invest a crore in a rooftop system, like say an SME. They'll they'll say it's critical to reducing their electricity consumption and becoming more competitive with the um, with their with their partners in the industry or their in their competitors in the industry. And then you come back a few months later and it's covered with dust and it's not been cleaned and they have assured us that they have the staff that will clean it and it's just becomes I think it's. It's about habit. You know, there's not been anything on the roof before that needed cleaning. We do offer a cleaning service, but I think sometimes your customers can be a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit focused too much on the pennies and not on the, not on the pounds, as you say. So it's a, uh, it's a battle to get them to sign up to our cleaning. Increasingly, we see that's happening because if you just clean regularly, I mean, it, it makes the cleaning costs absolutely irrelevant. You maximize your power production. So cleaning, I can only, especially as you know, in certain times of the year in India, it's quite dusty. You must clean the panels to maximize production. It's an absolute must. Right, and and you said that uh, three years is what it takes for some of these, let's say, on at the at the median for companies to recover. Yes. So if I put a crore for uh, yes. uh, uh, three hundred kilowatts, or let's say three crores yep. for a megawatt, uh, in three mm -hmm. years' time, I would have recovered that, and forty percent of my electricity bill is gone effectively. Yes, and the beauty of that going forward, it's, yeah, I mean, when you say gone, and the, the other way of thinking about it is 40% is free electricity. Yeah, right. It's free going forward. Yep. Right, and, and if, if uh, that's the case, uh, do people, I mean, uh, do people, uh, are, do they find this compelling enough to invest more or, uh, I mean, how, how do people see it? I mean, what's the value yeah, perception? It's a good like? question. I think the, when you talk to a, um, a proprietor and these proprietors or SMEs of SMEs are incredibly sharp because they, they act, they cover all parts of their business, right? They know the finance side, they know the technology side. They just know, they know all aspects of their business. Um, what you see is they often look at, okay, I, especially those, let's say those who have cash, they'll say, okay, I could put cash in my bank. It earns, you know, what a best case, eight or 9% on a fixed deposit. Um, or I can put it in this and it'll show us a return on investment of somewhere between 20 and 30%. So I think there is a, in that sense, it's a no brainer. If you've got cash where you should put it, you should put it into solar. The the and then obviously when you have finance and you, have, you add the cost of finance so the return might come down a bit but it still makes absolute sense so i think that's that is you the way that people typically see it 
The reality, however, in our day to day is that businesses, whether it's a corporate or an SME, they have other priorities. They have other CapEx needs. They may be, they need to invest in new machinery for their core business. And when that's happening, then it's very hard to get people to think about, okay, let me just add a whole bunch of CapEx for my rooftop. It can just be hard to get the focus of the proprietor or the directors or whoever it is that is making the decision. And, and I think that's our biggest competition. We often say our biggest competition is not the grid. It's not other solar companies. It's just the priorities of the business. Does it allow, do they have the bandwidth to allow for the solar, to take that solar decision and give it the time it needs to make a decision? I mean, since you mentioned uh, other players, is, I mean, how competitive is the market? I mean, uh, or is there enough demand for anyone and therefore uh, people come to you relatively more to, than you going to them? Well, look, we've been around 17 years, and so we have quite a good footprint in the market. So people do come to us, and I think we've, we have a very good track record on quality. So that quality speaks for itself. Our main source of business is word of mouth, customer referrals, which is you know, really something I'm proud of, and I, it's key to our business. So that's the first point. Um, there is competition. I think the, the best way to see it is like this. In rooftop solar, there are quite low barriers to entry. Um, anybody in a small town like Kumta, we said we started in Kumta, anybody can set up a small integrate, be an integrator in Kumta, buy some modules, buy some inverters and go and service solar for local industry. So it's not that you will get the same quality from a local integrator as from us. You might, but most often you won't. It's that local integrators will put a price into the market that's quite low. So pull down the prices for everyone else. So it's quite competitive in rooftop solar on price. There's lots of, it's low barriers to entry, quite a lot of players, quite a fragmented market. Um, so we have to, that's why we position ourselves as having high quality. We add extra services, we add finance. So we're able to attract a better price and a better margin. And so hold our own ground in the industry. So if um, I were to... Yeah, if I were to use an analogy, you know, uh, you had, let's say, uh, the Dells and uh, IBM, now Lenovo, uh, boxes. And then, uh, at least in India uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, you had small assemblers who used to put together the same boxes. Because finally, you could say, okay, I want an Intel, uh, this chip, and I want that hard drive. And it all comes together. And it seems to do the same thing, except that the box always would look unwieldy. And if I went and bought a Dell... Uh, or an HP, it would look slicker, and uh, obviously there was service and so on. But uh, is that is that a good analogy? Sort of and sort of not. I agree that the, if you go to an integrator, it might look a bit more boxy and a bit more ugly. Um, but you also there'll be some issues you want to be careful of. Um, the like the the cabling they use, the, the both the cabling they use, and then the you want to put the cabling inside an enclosure. So we use, for instance, uh, powder-coated cable trays, whereas a lot of guys will just use plastic PVC tubes. The, the rats will eat through the PVC tubes, they'll eat through your wiring, you're going to have issues. So you need to, you don't want to go too cheap on how you handle your cabling. Um, same with your inverters, you have to earth them properly. If you don't earth the inverter properly, we, we spend a lot of time doing that earthing properly as part of our installation, then your inverter will fry and your inverter will not have a track in a warrant. Uh, same with lightning arresters. You have to have a great lightning arrest or else you can find your whole system you right. know, is gone. So I think they're very critical. And also how you do the wiring prevents against voltage drops. If you know, they're just, they're, you, because this thing sits on your roof at on a warranty basis for 25 years. I want to be clear. I don't think we've touched on that. We warranty a solar panel for 25 years. Your payback is in three years. You have 22 years of free electricity after that warranted, and it's still going to go on after that. You want to make sure that that investment, I think, I would always pay a tiny bit more, and I'm just talking about a tiny bit more, to get a high-quality installation that's going to sit on my roof for 25 years than to go cheap and, you know, and just, and, as and you what said, does the, the And what does the warranty computer. cover? The, the warranty warranties. covers, um, it, it allows for a slight degradation of the panel. So after 25 years... If the panel in any year, um, I think it's something like 0.8% degradation. If it's not producing that output, we have to give you additional paneling or money to make up for that difference. So it covers the power output of the panel such that 
after 25 years, you you should be getting or you must be getting 80% of the rate rated wattage of that panel um, in you know after after in that time frame. So it just means that if you're getting if you're only getting 75%, we have to make up the additional 5% for you. Right. After 25 years. And, and uh, uh, give us a sense on what your experience has been in uh, rooftop for homes so far. And you did say that Maharashtra and Gujarat have seen a big spike in the last six months. Yep. And that's quite yep. interesting in itself. That obviously follows uh, the new solar mission uh, f that the, uh, the Prime Minister announced. I think it was January 23rd mm -hmm. or 24th. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, how has that been? Uh, how are people using? What's the, uh, what's the payback like for that segment? Yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's a, a um, there's no question that because, as we said, the the tariff for residential customers in India are typically lower than commercial and industrial tariffs, that there has been a disincentive for the residential customer to buy solar over the years. Um, the payback, as I said, we've seen, say, in the last five years before the announcement was sitting somewhere around six to seven years payback. For, for a consumer, unless you're very oriented towards sustainability, green energy, you probably wouldn't have done it. Uh, then with the subsidy and with the recent decline in module prices also globally, you now see the payback is sitting between four and five years. So suddenly there is a really keen interest from the residential customer to do this. I think the other beauty that we see with a lot of residential customers is that they can make an investment. Again, it's a 25-year investment. And because they, a lot of, say it's a standalone home, has a decent-sized roof that, say, can accommodate 10 kilowatts, you can literally zero out the electricity bill. You can literally make your electricity bill zero because most people in India, the electricity demands are still relatively low, one or two ACs, a fridge. You know, it's quite reasonable compared to a McMansion in the United States, right? It's just a different consumption level of electricity. So people can really zero out their electricity bill in residential. And I find that, and that is extremely attractive. And, and That's for a very an, attractive proposition. And, and you're saying for an average uh, installation of yours, uh, it's able to power, let's say, one air conditioner apart from, let's say, the running stuff like refrigerators and so on? But I, I want to be clear, Govind, it can do anything. It can, I mean, even if you have 10 ACs, then you'll just you'll use a, a mix more. of the grid and solar, yeah. and you'll and you'll just use more grid than solar. So then you'll probably just offset 20 20 percent of your electricity bill, thirty percent. But if you're not using that much AC and you've just got your fridge and your TV and you know the lighting and fans, yeah, you can you can and you've got a decent sized rooftop, then you have a chance of you know offsetting eighty to hundred percent of your bill. And uh, I mean, this is something that I should have asked earlier, but uh, uh, what's the, the, the peak time utilization uh, in India? Uh, and I'm assuming it's roughly the same across the country, but uh, and from what yeah. time to what time? And then does it fade off? Yeah, no. So obviously you see most of the, the requirements kicking in uh, for residential, obviously in the nighttime, the morning time, and then during the day, it's less. And that's the beauty of net metering because... Even if during the day everybody's out, they've gone to school, they've gone to the office in the house, it's producing power and it's feeding into the grid. And then you're offsetting your bill at the end of the at the end of the month. So you don't have to have a battery to get that benefit of it. The grid smoothens out, the net metering smoothens out those those peaks and those right. Troughs. But but on a on a normal day, uh, the solar panels could be generating till six p.m., seven p.m. How does that? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, so just, I mean, it depends on the time of year. The sun rises earlier this time of year than it does, obviously, in December, January. Uh, it's set later this time of year than December, January. So, but you can expect, I mean, the peak output is always around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's your peak. That's the strongest, um, even to three. But, uh, you know, but you're still generating power. And it'll, you'll see it'll look like a bell curve, right? It'll... It'll ramp up like this, and then it'll come down like this during the course of the day. And, and then obviously at night, there's nothing. Right. Last question. So uh, as you look ahead, uh, Damien, how are you seeing, uh, you know, there are many other things going on at the same time, right? Temperatures are rising. Mm. Uh, people's need sure. for, let's say, yes. uh, cooling will increase in homes and mm -hmm. in industry. Uh, and that's quite clear now from all the projections. 
And at the same time, uh, we want energy to be more sustainable and uh, therefore are investing in it and indeed subsidizing it as well, uh, uh, including mm -hmm. by governments. So what's the near to medium term future looking like and what are the big trends that you're seeing? Okay, so I think the big trend is just that solar has become, since I started Orb Energy uh, back in 2006, solar has become gone from being niche to being mainstream. So everybody now, especially since the prime minister's announcement, has really heard about rooftop solar for the home. And certainly among industrialists, uh, it's, solar has become just everybody and every industrialist that I ever talk to knows that solar makes sense. It's just about when they will do it, not if they will do it. So it's become mainstream in a very different way that I think is extremely exciting for India. And if you look at the Indian economy and how it's projected to grow, and the needs that India has both for a forex reason as well as energy independence. I think solar is the most exciting energy source for India by far looking forward over the, the course of India's growth trajectory over the next 20 or 30 years. So I, wouldn't, I would expect by 2060, 2070, more than 50% of India's electricity will be coming from solar. It will be that big in India. What will... Uh, drive it. I think actually we already have the technology. We already have the cost reduction. We already have all the financing coming in place. So those key things that drive diffusion of a technology, they're in place and now it, now it needs to rip. The, uh, the next piece of the puzzle that will come that we discussed briefly earlier is storage. So and what you see in other markets, for instance, in the United States, is you have peak pricing that for customers. So then you as a customer can decide, hey, you know what? Right now, the grid is costing me a lot. It's 8 p.m. It's peak hours. Uh, therefore, I'm going to use my battery that's filled with solar power that I generated as my electricity source. I'm not going to buy from the grid. And you start to have that interplay between the cost of electricity from the grid and the cost of electricity that you're generating from your solar system plus battery. And I think that'll get very exciting in India. But it's a it's a political decision. As you know, electricity in India is a big political hot potato. And, you know, the idea that now you're not you're going to introduce peak pricing consumers is something that many consumers may not like. But it is the thing that will drive more solar adoption and more yeah, self-sufficiency with batteries as well. And it's a, I think that's the next big ev evolution. The next big regulatory move will be peak pricing of electricity and the introduction of storage coupled with solar to, uh, to let customers decide when they use grid power, when they use solar power. Right. And all of this, uh, I didn't get into this in the beginning, but and all of this is a profitable business for companies like you? Yes, we're profitable. Yes, absolutely. We're profitable. Yep. We had a good, had a good year last year. <laughs> so, yes, it is profitable and it's a growing part of the business. And, and when you I'm say sorry, profitable, you mean, uh, I mean, no accumulated losses and profitable on an ongoing basis, right? Oh, no, we might have accumulated losses because for many years it was a challenging sector. But I think what has changed now is that the we're, we, we are seeing very good profits that are eroding those accumulated losses very quickly. So I think within another year for us, those are gone. And it's just a very different order magnitude of volume now. And I think the key, uh, your key, if you're running a solar business, it's that investment of time and energy into building your reputation, into executing well at a high quality level so that you get decent margins, decent pricing. And then you have to keep your costs down. On it, you have to keep your operating costs down. And if you get, and for us, because we're well positioned, we get, we're seeing good growth in demand, good growth in revenue. We're keeping our operating costs down. We have our own manufacturing that helps to keep the cost of goods down. Uh, so we're able to get that a decent margin. That means now at these revenue levels, we're, we're profitable. Right. And that's a good note to end on. Uh, Damien, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Thanks, Govan. Cheers. It's been a pleasure.